Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Um, my name is Jackie Morris. I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure. And before we kick off, I would like to uh, pay my respects to the Aboriginal traditional owners of this land, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and to the elders past and present of Australia's Indigenous peoples. Ben Wellings is a senior lecturer in politics and international relations in the School of Social, Scientists, uh, so Social Sciences at Monash University. He's no stranger to Canberra. Um, he was here from 2004 to 2013 as the convener of European studies at the ANU. In 2012, he published his book, English Nationalism and Euroscepticism in which he wrestled with the slippery notion of English nationalism and its more concrete manifestation in resistance to European integration. Fast forward to 2016, so it was a prescient work, Euroscepticism became much more concrete with the referendum of um, 23, July in favor of the U uh, 23 of June in favour of the UK leaving the European Union. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ben Wellings to speak on the topic of taking back control, Parliament sovereignty and Brexit. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you uh, all for coming and being here. And perhaps I can just uh, do a few quick extra uh, thank yous uh, here. Tony, um, uh, Felia, who uh, is up the back, I think, and, uh, uh, but also maybe Josh and Eloise, uh, two former ANU students who apparently have some hand in, uh, in me being here. So thank you uh, to them as well. Um, like Jackie said, it's been uh, uh, interesting times, as the apocryphal Chinese proverb uh, has it. Um, whatever uh, I may think of uh, Brexit, I can certainly say it's been good for business. Uh, so um, uh, that's... Uh, uh, plenty of food for uh, thought and for discussions like these and, and when we were, were thinking late last year about what uh, might actually say and talk about in this uh, particular uh, occasional uh, lecture, uh, the idea came about that something about parliaments uh, would be uh, appropriate and interesting of course, you know, being where we are. Um, and. It got me thinking really uh, about sovereignty, of course, which is uh, you know, an enormous uh, concept when it comes to uh, Euroscepticism and Britain's place in, in the European Union. Uh, but I was particularly uh, Im impressed, uh, if you like, or, or, or scared, depending on uh, how you look at it, when I went over to do some research in the immediate aftermath of, of Brexit. And it struck me that I didn't really, couldn't really tell who was in charge. Uh, in that sort of time after the Brexit vote had happened, David Cameron had stepped down, uh, Theresa May was not yet uh, Prime Minister and we were going through sort of the various kind of backstabbings and, uh, uh, and underhand uh, tactics that meant that uh, neither Gove nor Boris Johnson nor Andrea Leedsom uh, would actually be Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom. I felt like that apocryphal uh, Martian who might have arrived uh, uh, in London uh, in July 2016 and said, take me to your leader. And of course, someone would say, well, I'm sorry, I don't really know who that is at the moment. Um, but it wasn't just uh, questions of um, uh, leadership. It was also uh, questions of um, which corporate body, if you like, was in charge. Um, was the government in charge of the United Kingdom? Was uh, Parliament uh, in charge of the United Kingdom? Were the people in charge of the United Kingdom? So what I want to say in this, uh, in this lecture is that Brexit opened up uh, an awful lot of uh, opportunity, if you like, for various different bodies to take back control. Right? You're probably familiar with the, the, the slogan that was the Leave campaign's uh, really quite ingenious uh, three-word slogan, uh, take back control, that could be read on all sorts of different, uh, all sorts of different levels. Uh, on one hand, it was uh, about um, uh, taking back control of, uh, of local communities from uh, foreigners, from immigrants. Uh, on another hand, it was also read as a constitutional argument about taking back control from Brussels. But in the wake of the vote, there were all sorts of grey areas that, uh, that uh, opened up. Uh, in which allowed various different parliaments, not just the Westminster Parliament, I'm going to be coming to that uh, in, a, in, a, in a while, not just the Westminster Parliament, but various different parliaments to take back control from each other. 
So what I want to say is, first of all, that Brexit is not just the referendum vote of June 2016, but it's the politics of nationalist mobilisation leading up to that vote, and it's also the politics of disengagement subsequent to that vote. Right? So that's when I talk about Brexit, I'm talking about uh, an extended period uh, in uh, the, the first uh, three quarters of this, uh, this decade, if not slightly longer. Um, and it also opened up questions about sovereignty. Are we talking about post-sovereignty? Are we talking about good old-fashioned sovereignty? Uh, and where might these different uh, understandings of sovereignty pertain uh, within the United uh, Kingdom itself? So what I will be speaking about in the next uh, 40 minutes or so um, is to talk about the place of referendums in the United Kingdom. Importantly, quite different to uh, Australian understandings of uh, referendums and how they come about. Uh, how that links to popular sovereignty, which also has a, a quite a peculiar place in uh, British uh, political uh, theory, and a slightly newer, though not unheard of, uh, phenomenon in, in British politics, populism. And of course, we know that there is a kind of a, a populist moment happening around the world. Brexit is in, is in part uh, an expression, a peculiar expression of that in, in the United Kingdom. Um, but I also am importantly going to break down the United Kingdom into its constituent components, because that is a really, really important element in understanding Brexit uh, and the politics uh, uh, thereafter. So first of all, I want to talk about the government's understanding of sovereignty. Uh, and, and what I'm calling the new English unionism. And I should say at the outset here that, that unionism in British political um, terminology is not the same as unionism here. It's not about trade unions. It is about supporting the union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And in particular, the really important relationship there is between Scotland and England. Okay, so I want to say something about the place of England uh, in, uh, in this uh, moment of uh, Brexit. And then I'm going to talk about the devolved administrations, um, Scotland, Wales and, and London. Scotland is the most salient uh, and important of these uh, particular instances um, because it, it has the greatest uh, autonomy from uh, Westminster. And then uh, say something about sovereignty, Brexit, and the northern, uh, the border between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland in Northern Ireland. So we know, of course, that the United Kingdom does have a land border with the EU. It's with the Republic of Ireland, and I suspect you'll be no uh, strangers to some of the politics that are happening there. But also, questions of sovereignty really pertain uh, in that part of the United Kingdom as well. And then lastly, I want to focus on uh, Parliament itself, and, and I should say in some ways I'm reflecting my kind of old uh, English biases there, uh, I really mean Westminster, okay, because there are many parliaments uh, in the United Kingdom uh, now. That fact hasn't always percolated down uh, or, or up, depending on your point of view, to uh, Westminster and to uh, the English, but nevertheless um, uh, Westminster uh, is still in an important position in the United Kingdom and I want to refer to it as the squeezed middle. Uh, for, for reasons that I will um, uh, explain as we go on. So um, this then is where we are at. You probably remember this uh, particular um, uh, distribution of support for um, leave and uh, remain. The yellow uh, is leave from the referendum of uh, 2016, uh, I beg your pardon, is remain from the referendum of 2016, uh, and the blue is leave. And the central uh, map, I think, brings out really starkly the, the kind of national differences that uh, the Brexit referendum uh, itself of 2016 threw, uh, threw into light. And the, the thing that stands out there most obviously is Scotland. You know, it's, it's an actual, not just a political, you know, it's not just a, a map of voting uh, um, uh, preferences, it's actually a map of Scotland as well. You know, that, that neatly mapped onto each other. You can see that Northern Ireland is divided. Um, the fact that Northern Ireland is divided will come as no surprise to many of you, and that cleavage fell very closely along sectarian lines. And you can see that the picture is a little bit more problematic uh, and dispersed when you get into uh, England and Wales, but the, the fact is, is that England outside of London uh, is really predominantly for leave. Now, um, this 
alerts us to the fact that, um, that Brexit was an important element of Brexit, and I'm trying to sort of add something here to this idea of, of Brexit as a, a revolt of those left behind by globalization. The important element of this uh, was actually national differences, all right? The, the kind of nationalist mobilization that had taken place up to a, 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 and before the actual vote itself. And um, what we want to say about this then is that in the two decades before the Brexit vote, there had been a process of embedding devolved administrations throughout uh, the United Kingdom, right? So, of course, uh, Scotland, uh, Wales, London, Northern Ireland, uh, more recently in some northwestern regions of, of, of the United Kingdom. Um, but what we're dealing with here is not a federal structure. I think that's an important point to, of comparison to make out if we're, if we're thinking about this comparatively. We're not dealing with a federation. We're dealing with an asymmetrically devolved state, right? It, you might call it a kind of a, a, a quasi-federation, um, which is also losing, uh, removing itself from another quasi-federation, the European Union. Right? And so these different moving parts, if you like, open up a lot of grey areas. And I had a, a, a legal uh, scholar uh, colleague once told me that if you, don't, if you can't exploit the grey areas, then you're not a good lawyer. And I think that's true in politics as well. You, know, you need to be able to exploit those grey areas. And that is what Brexit has done. It has, um, I think, illuminated the grey areas. It's probably an oxymoron. It has, it has deepened these, these, um, these divisions uh, and opened up some uh, areas to uh, exploit. So um, this is where each of these uh, different uh, areas seeks to take back control, not just from the EU, but from each other too. So let me say something about um, referendums, uh, popular sovereignty and, and populism in, in the United Kingdom. And I'll get to uh, Mr. Farage's quote in a moment. So since 1997, referendums have become a feature of British politics, all right, especially when associated with constitutional reform. So there's the first thing to note. Until recently, referendums were not common in British politics. Uh, um, they have a, appeared with increasing uh, frequency, if you like, since 1997 when New Labour came in, part of what Chris Gifford calls New Labour's Labour's strategy of governing uh, populism. Um, and we've seen them uh, to uh, endorse the decision to uh, establish a parliament in Scotland or re-establish the parliament in Scotland uh, and, and an assembly in Wales in 1997. Um, we've seen a further uh, referendum in Wales uh, in 2011. There was one associated, of course, uh, in 1998, I beg your pardon, with the Good Friday Agreement uh, in um, uh, in uh, Ireland and uh, the Northern Ireland. There was uh, a, a, a referendum in the northeast of England on whether there should be an, a regional assembly in 2004. There was one, of course, the Scottish independence referendum in 2014, and then uh, the EU referendum itself of 2016. So you can see that, that uh, perhaps something has changed in, in the nature of British politics in that we see this increasing re recourse to the device of a referendum. Oftentimes they're used in, in that particular period as a de facto endorsement of decisions that have already been made. Okay, so in particular, devolution to Scotland and Wales was supposed to be, uh, was a decision that had already been made by the new Labour government, um, uh, but uh, a referendum was uh, deployed to give it like extra legitimacy. Okay, and that, that, that's an important unintended consequence is, is, that, is that now referendums are in some ways a kind of a bulwark against uh, the re-extension or the, or the reclamation of powers uh, of Westminster in, in these devolved uh, areas. And also something else to note uh, is when referendums didn't happen. Okay, so in amongst all those uh, dates uh, of the last 20 years that I gave you, um, were the non-referendum on joining the Euro, the United Kingdom's joining the Euro in 2003, and the referendum that the United Kingdom didn't have to have in 2005 on the draft constitutional treaty of the European Union because the French and Dutch had already rejected it. 
Right? So the point there is that sometimes just threatening to have a referendum is enough to derail a particular course uh, of uh, political uh, action because the implied notion was that the public was so Eurosceptic that they would just reject these uh, ideas uh, anyway. And we might sort of say, well, that's probably well-founded. Um, <clears throat> however, all this political activity around referendums masks the fact that such a device was a novelty in British politics. Now, I'm talking about UK-wide politics here because there are local instances of referendums that have taken place even since the 19th uh, century. So um, establishing public libraries was one that you would have local referendums on uh, in, in the 19th century. Uh, in 1946, a town called Stevenage in Hertfordshire had a referendum where they said that we do not want a new town for um, people from London uh, built next to us, right? So they, they voted to reject the notion of uh, Stevenage New Town in 1946. In Wales in 1961, there was a referendum on whether to ban drinking or not, okay? And uh, some areas voted to ban drinking and some areas voted not to ban drinking. So for a while in Wales, you had uh, a kind of a, a dry state and a non-dry state. And uh, uh, you can imagine uh, how that w went down in certain households. And then there was a so-called Northern Ireland border poll in 1973, um, uh, which was supposed to uh, endorse uh, the border uh, of Northern Ireland, but it was boycotted by the nationalist community. So you can also uh, see that, that questions of participation are important uh, here. Um, and of course, and I'll get to this in, in, in a little while, the first referendum uh, in the United, for all of the United Kingdom was in 1975 on whether to remain a member of the common market, as it was then known. Now, the outcome of the Stevenage poll in 1946, the new town was built anyway, uh, gives you some sense of um, the principal problem of referendums in uh, British politics. Referendums in British politics can only technically ever be advisory if you believe and uphold the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. The principle of parliamentary sovereignty says that no parliament can bind its successor. There is no higher authority than parliament in the United Kingdom. And you can see how joining the European Union is going to problematize uh, that particular understanding uh, of sovereignty. And so, in a way, when the 1975 referendum took place, it actually opened up an alternative source of authority in British politics that was not Parliament, right? It was the people. Now, I know that might sort of sound strange in a democracy, and of course, there's, you know, elections uh, have a, uh, an inbuilt kind of um, sense of, uh, of populism uh, in them, but uh, there was, a very strong strand in British government that was a kind of a mixture of Tory paternalism, Labour welfare statism, and a kind of a Sir Humphrey government uh, you know, steering from Whitehall that came up with the, 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 the overall sum of which was that government knows best, was the, the, the way it was expressed. That, that basically um, uh, the United Kingdom existed under what uh, uh, Lord Hailsham once called an elective uh, dictatorship. That is to say, um, uh, every four or five years, the electorate would uh, vote enormous powers to uh, the executive uh, government uh, via parliament, uh, and the executive government would rule until uh, the next uh, set of election uh, came, uh, came around. So we're, we're getting some building in some, some subtle differences here to, uh, to the Australian uh, situation where you know, sovereignty, um, uh, there is of course a notion of sovereignty built into section 128 where if you want to change the constitution uh, you have to uh, have um, an, uh, a referendum. The difference here, of course, is that referendums in the United Kingdom are not triggered by constitutional change automatically. It's a political decision, right? So the more closer an analogy between Australian uh, referendums and United Kingdom referendums are, would be last year's postal ballot. Okay, so what happens is that, is that a party loses control of an issue. Uh, and, and that issue is then uh, presented to the electorate uh, as, a, as a matter of either conscience or supreme uh, national importance, which must be decided by the people who are suddenly constituted uh, as a source of authority above uh, that uh, of um, the politicians uh, and uh, the executive government. Um, 
when in 1975 Harold Wilson uh, decided to uh, implement uh, a referendum on, um, uh, on Britain's membership of the common market, he actually borrowed heavily from Australian practice. Okay? Uh, one of the things he didn't do was he felt that computers were not necessary at this stage to count the votes, uh, so he, he decided to abjure that. They were still counted by hand at that particular stage. Um, but a lot of the policy exchange was still coming uh, from Australia in that uh, particular uh, case. But this, the reason it got to a referendum in that particular instance was because um, the uh, Labour Party which was governing and was the main Eurosceptic party in 1975, was so irrevocably split on this, both within the cabinet and between leadership and the rank and file, um, that uh, the, 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 the pro, or at least agnostically European uh, leadership said, OK, let's put this to the people. Um, now, when, when that happened, uh, there was a two to one vote in favour of staying in uh, the EU, uh, sorry, the, the common market as it, as it then was. Um, but from the perspective of sovereignty and, and popular sovereignty, the cat is out of the bag, right? So it set up a precedent that actually the people uh, need to be consulted on an issue of uh, importance, uh, an important constitutional uh, matter such as this. And we see the Labour Party, when it comes back to power in 1997, pick up this theme of uh, referendums as an endorsement uh, of constitutional uh, change. But I'm going to fast forward now to the Conservative, or at least the coalition uh, as it was, um, uh, government of 2010 uh, to 15, which also started to build in this um, necessity for a referendum in order to increase the powers of the European uh, Union. Um, or at least its competencies uh, within uh, British uh, politics. And this is something called the EU Act of 2011, which, which builds in what was called at the time a referendum lock. That is to say that if the European Union wanted to increase its competencies uh, over any uh, country, but you know, in, it would apply to all countries, but in particular the U United Kingdom, that the Euro United Kingdom was obliged to have a referendum on this. Okay? Now that, that potentially meant a lot of referendums. So there was still uh, an idea that um, uh, it would be a political decision to decide what uh, actually represented a, a fundamental transfer of competency, uh, but nevertheless, it was now building in this notion of popular sovereignty into the British uh, political um, uh, system, which had not been there before. And as, uh, as I, uh, Emma Vines and myself were, were tried to make this case when analysing the EU Act uh, of 2011, this had the unintended consequence of undermining that which it sought to protect. Right? So the idea was is that you would use a referendum to protect the sovereignty of Westminster against further competencies of the European Union extended over the United Kingdom. But what it did was actually open up an alternative source of authority or sovereignty um, by building the people uh, and the referendum device into um, the British political system itself. Now, that was a way to an attempt at least to manage the growing rise of popular discontent that was aimed both at the British political class and at the European Union um, uh, in the years after uh, 2010, particularly after the global uh, financial crisis and the parliamentary expenses scandal of 2009. So, this, this kind of revolt, this kind of populist revolt, is exemplified, of course, by uh, the, United, the UK Independence Party uh, and uh, Nigel uh, Farage. And, and in his speech uh, to um, uh, the European Parliament two days after, or sorry, one, five days after the referendum uh, in June 2016, he really pulled out uh, the kind of the populist element here. Um, you can, you can, you can read, read these quotes, I'm sure you, ha you have done already, but the, the part I'll pull out was that, you know, he says that what happened last Thursday was a remarkable result. What the little people did, what the ordinary people did, the people who'd been oppressed over the last few years, he was really pitting the people against um, not only the European Union, but also the pro-European political class in the United Kingdom. 
And this shifts then from notions of popular sovereignty to populism. Okay, the popu populism is, is slightly different in, in as much as it suggests that they're, um, I'm drawing on Kazmuda's work here, but basically conflict in society is, is, is that between uh, a pure people who are um, uh, expressive of the general will uh, and, and all kind of virtuous uh, values uh, in, uh, in the political community and, and an elite that have been corrupted. They've been corrupted by um, their proximity to power, either in a, in a direct sense, in sort of lining their own pockets, uh, or they've been corrupted indirectly through um, uh, too much proximity to uh, vested interests that are beyond the reach of uh, democratic uh, control. So um, populism, of course, is a slightly difficult ideology, if we want to call it. It's not, it's not necessarily formed up as an ideology as, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in, a, in a very formed up and thought about way. Uh, it is, if you like, a kind of a, an expression of, uh, of resentment. And, um, uh, but it does have quite close links with um, uh, democracy uh, and uh, nationalism and nationhood. Uh, in the United Kingdom contents, context, it's opened up this question, well, if the people are sovereign, which people exactly are we talking about? If, if you seek to express a general will through uh, a referendum device, it assumes that uh, you know who or what the political community is, uh, or indeed that one exists. And Brexit started to show that that was not necessarily something that could be taken for granted. Now, this shifts us on to the government's position and what I'm going to call for now, but we'll problematize and come back to later, as the new English unionism. Now, I've suggested before that the politics of nationalist mobilization has complicated this understanding of a single political community. So when Theresa May said uh, in the wake of Brexit that we voted to leave the United Kingdom as a single United uh, Kingdom and we will leave the United, uh, sorry, we voted to leave the European Union as a single United Kingdom uh, and therefore we will leave the uh, European Union as a single United Kingdom, she's making a claim there. In a way that claim is an attempt to take back control from other parts of the kingdom uh, which are seeking their own autonomy. Uh, and in particular, she had Scotland in mind uh, when she said this. And I think it was very interesting, again, you know, watching this play out um, uh, on the 13th of July 2016, when Theresa May came back from Buckingham Palace, having um, accepted the Queen's invitation, another source of uh, sovereignty in the United Kingdom, to, be, uh, to form a government, the first thing she did, other than thank uh, David Cameron for being a, a terrific uh, Prime Minister, uh, was defend the Union. She didn't highlight immediately leaving the European Union. What was a, a greater priority to her, if we, if we take um, uh, the way her speech was constructed as, as an ind indication, uh, was the United Kingdom. She says, not everybody knows this. Sounds like Michael Caine doing that, doesn't she? Says, not everybody knows this, but the full title of my party is the Conservative and Unionist Party. And that word unionist, unionist is very important to me. She continued, it means we believe in the union, the precious, precious bond between England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. But it means something else that is just as important. It means we believe in a union not just between the nations of the United Kingdom, but between all of our citizens, every one of us, whoever we are and wherever we're from. Now, of course, so what she's trying to do there is, is talk not just about the political union of the United Kingdom, but the, the social divisions that have been opened up by the, the, the distribution of votes um, for remain and leave across uh, the United Kingdom, but especially in England, um, and making a claim to, to sort of take back control uh, over, um, over some kind of uh, redistributive uh, policy, which um, seems not to have uh, taken place. Um, but the point is that when Theresa May told voters that the United Kingdom was precious to her, this was a Southern English Conservative Prime Minister defending Britishness, right? So this is, this is one version of what uh, I've called elsewhere English nationalism. If we start to disentangle England from Britain, 
An elite version of English nationalism is characterized by the desire to defend British sovereignty. Right? This is where the kind of the, the, the conflation between England and Britain starts to uh, take place. And in, and in this point of view, Brexit involved a three-level gain. Right? Not only getting the UK out of the EU, one level, and seeking alternative uh, or, or, or traditional uh, allies outside of the EU, the second level, but also keeping the United Kingdom united while all that was going on. That's the third level. So there are three things going on there. But within England, the Conservatives, who until 2017 were, were, were very much the, the kind of the English uh, party by name, uh, if, uh, sorry, by deed if not by name, we're now playing a double game with England. England was crucial to understanding the vote to leave, but it was also crucial if the Conservatives were to keep the United Kingdom united. Because if the English stop believing in the United Kingdom, then there, there, there is going to be, be trouble, as we shall see. Um, but this UK government uh, perspective, which, which by virtue of its, of its support within the Conservative Party becomes de facto uh, English, is actually um, uh, a very English conception of uh, un United Kingdom sovereignty as singular and unified. Okay, that, that Westminster could, if it wished to, rescind the devolved administrations in uh, Scotland, Wales, in the same way as it has done in Northern Ireland, although, of course, for very different reasons. Um, now, I'm not saying that that would be um, uh, very uh, provocative and inflammatory, and it may, of course, although it's technically possible, it may be politically impossible, um, uh, but nevertheless, that idea of sovereignty, of, of the Westminster Parliament's sovereignty, of the executive government's sovereignty, uh, still uh, remains. Now, you can imagine how that kind of understanding of sovereignty is received in Edinburgh and Cardiff. Uh, it sets alarm bells uh, uh, ringing uh, and was predictably resisted um, by the devolved administrations, both the Scottish National Party administration under uh, Nicola Sturgeon, but also uh, the, um, the Welsh Labour administration, um, uh, administration operating uh, in Cardiff. And, and the reasons that there is this disjuncture here is because the notion of the British Constitution, right? now remember I'm not talking about a written uh, document here, I'm talking about a kind of an accepted ways of doing things, uh, sometimes um, uh, characterised as a customary uh, constitution, has been steadily challenged by changes in Scotland and Wales since devolution in 1999 and, and, and the way that that has uh, bedded down. Um, this change has not been well understood or recognized in Westminster or Whitehall, I would say. So, so what we've got here are different and competing understandings of sovereignty uh, that are operating within the United Kingdom as Britain comes out of the EU. So in Scotland, um, these differing conceptions of, of popular sovereignty have existed actually for a long time. Um, and, and in reverse order, there have been so-called claims of right uh, made on behalf of or by the Scottish people both in 1989 after the, the imposition of the poll tax, in 1842 which was to do with um, uh, problems uh, in the Scottish uh, Kirk and even in 1689 about the, um, uh, after the, uh, the revolution of 1688. But um, as I said this reality has gone little noticed in Westminster or Whitehall, even Downing Street but it, it, it is a strong way of understanding uh, uh, sovereignty in Scotland. So, for example, a good ex expression of this is um, when the Scottish Parliament opened in 1999, the Speaker of the Scottish House, Winnie Ewing, um, made the, the point that this was a reconvening of the Scottish Parliament, which had not met since 1707. So if you think that you know, Australian parliamentarians don't meet, me in, often enough, uh, you know, to two centuries is, or three centuries is, is even further. But the point she's making, this was a reconvening of the Scottish Parliament. It had, it had, it had, had, it had gone into abeyance uh, since 1707 and now it was back. So what was seen as a constitutional innovation from London, from Edinburgh, was seen as a restitution. So, um, of course, the, Scot the Scots had their own uh, independence referendum uh, of 2014, which was... Uh, 
another way of saying taking back control. I mean, in this, in this instance, taking back control from Westminster, uh, even if uh, the idea was is that you would uh, retain it uh, within, um, uh, within the European, uh, you would, uh, you would uh, retain a measure of oversight from Brussels within the European uh, Union. Um, however, the, the fact that the English majority at Westminster agreed that a referendum should take place and whatever the result was that the result should be respected seemed to suggest that the United Kingdom was now a voluntary union, all right? that, that, that this idea that, um, uh, that it was unitary had uh, somehow broken down. I mean, the, the, the Catalan option, if I can call it that, was technically possible, that the, the London could have done what Madrid did and just declare it as illegal and ignore it. Um, but, it, but it didn't, and then that, that sort of fits into notions of, of, of British, uh, uh, British politics and incrementalism. Um, but even, even with that, the idea that um, uh, Scotland uh, was somehow different did not, um, uh, did not uh, enter into the official mind uh, uh, very strongly in Theresa May's government. And Theresa May's um, uh, method and means of getting uh, the UK out of the EU is just a reassertion of, of uh, the government's control uh, over, over Scotland. So both um, um, Scotland uh, and uh, Wales in their different uh, ways, the Scotland Act of 2016 reasserted that the devolved parliament cannot be rescinded without recourse to a referendum um, uh, in Scotland. Right? The Wales Act of, nine, of 2017 mimicked the Scotland Act in stating that the Assembly or Senate could not be rescinded without a referendum. So, so here again, we've got the sovereignty of the Welsh and Scottish people, which is now a bulwark against uh, the extension of executive control uh, over the United uh, Kingdom. And of course, we are waiting for um, uh, IndyRef 2, the possibility that there would be another referendum on independence in Scotland, as and when the terms of the Brexit uh, deal uh, are announced. I mean, that, that is uh, up in the balance, and I don't know that that would be an easy uh, uh, thing for the Scottish National Party to win, despite the, uh, the very pro-EU uh, vote uh, that we saw in, in 2016. And lastly, a quick word about London. London, of course, is very connected to the European Union. Uh, this might be an apocryphal story, but they do say that London is France's seventh most populous city, uh, just because of the number of uh, French people who've uh, subsequently moved uh, to, to London to work in that sector. Um, uh, the London administration uh, is very um, uh, unfavorably disposed towards uh, uh, Brexit, but it doesn't have uh, the, 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 the strength and the autonomy that the Scottish uh, Parliament uh, itself uh, has. So this leads us then to perhaps the most difficult and contentious part of um, uh, Brexit and the kind of shared sovereignty, if you like, that, uh, that operates. Um, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, which is to say the border between the United Kingdom and the European Union, um, or the land border between uh, those two countries, um, is um, the hardest square to circle in the Brexit negotiations. And this is partly because uh, there is a fear that in reimposing a physical border uh, uh, in, on the island of Ireland um, will reignite the troubles. You know, the, the Good Friday Agreement, we just had the, 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 the um, 20th anniversary of those uh, last week, uh, brought a kind of an uneasy truce uh, there, and it seemed to have bedded down. Uh, but we know that, that the government uh, of Northern Ireland has not been able to, to sit for the last uh, few months, and Westminster actually has um, uh, is, is rule is, is imposing, well, not imposing, but is um, uh, applying direct rule uh, in uh, Northern Ireland uh, as we as we speak. And the difficulty comes in the negotiations is because um, back in December it was agreed that there would be no uh, restitution of a hard border in Northern Ireland as part of the Brexit uh, deal. Uh, on the other hand, it was also stated that Britain would not be part of the single market. And those two things uh, at the moment seem to be contradictory, right? So, so the question is, well, what, what happens to uh, Northern Ireland? Where, where, in fact, will the border of the United Kingdom start and stop? What side of the Irish Channel, uh, the Irish Sea, will we find um, uh, the United Kingdom border? Because if, if, the, if Northern Ireland remains within 
the single market or even the customs union or a customs union, um, that means that effectively the United, the, the Northern Ireland is not as much a part of the United Kingdom as it once was. So, so this is the hard part. But, but here we've got all sorts of like overlapping sovereignties. Right? This is not just a question of uh, the United Kingdom uh, and Westminster dealing uh, with um, uh, a devolved uh, assembly. Uh, to some extent, the Republic of Ireland has a say in the governance of Northern Ireland. Um, also, the, the European Union, of course, used to have a lot of say in the governance uh, of Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, all those things are part of the grey areas that are coming apart uh, uh, as, the, as the Brexit uh, negotiations uh, pull out. Now, of course, you might not be surprised to learn that um, the British government is not keen on their losing Northern Ireland. All right. Although the, the, the constitutional position in the Good Friday Agreement was that uh, if there is a referendum in favour of Northern Ireland leaving the United Kingdom, you know, presumably to join uh, the Republic of Ireland, but I'm not sure how keen the Republic of Ireland would really be about, uh, be about that. Nevertheless, that, that is the point. But the British government position is that um, you know, it will not lose Northern Ireland. So Theresa May... Um, uh, said or pledged on the 29th of March, so this was one year in after the triggering of Article 50, uh, with another year to go, pledged to defend the integrity of the United Kingdom, which she described as the world's most successful union. Okay, she said there's no way we're going to break that up. So um, they did uh, a poll. Um, YouGov, along with LBC, did a poll saying, you know, okay, everyone, what would you rather do? Would you rather leave the European Union or would you rather retain the uh, Northern Ireland in the United Kingdom? And when you look at it overall, the overall vote was that most people in Britain would prefer to leave the EU than keep Northern Ireland in the UK. Right? When you look at conservative voters who, or, or voters who claim they have voted um, a conservative in 2017, 61% of Conservative voters said they would rather leave the EU than retain Northern Ireland. When you look at people who said that they voted for leave, uh, uh, leaving the EU in 2016, 71% of leave voters said they would rather leave the EU than retain the United Kingdom. Now, the headline of this was that, you know, uh, looking at this was that um, the majority of, uh, uh, sorry, that the Brits, you know, the majority of Brits uh, would rather leave the EU than the UK. But again, we have to infer here, and, and, and polling companies and, uh, and social scientists are not great at asking the question of, uh, of England at the moment. So we infer. So then we look at, um, uh, when we look at uh, Scots um, there, we find that actually more Scots want to keep um, uh, Northern Ireland in the UK than leave the EU. So what this is is a British response. Sorry, this is an English response. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm returning now to the importance of England. You know, we've looked at all the devolved administrations, but I'm returning to the importance of England. England is crucial in what happens uh, in Brexit. And I want to then, uh, for that reason, sort of say, well, okay, actually, the idea of a new English unionism isn't quite right. Okay, so the, the kind of language that Theresa May is using is a, is a form of unionism that seems to have its roots and wellsprings uh, in uh, England, in particularly uh, in southern England. But actually what we see is the strength of uh, unionism, if we, if we take this, I mean, I know we're not supposed to pay any attention to polls, uh, but it's, it's too tempting. If we take this as some kind of evidence that uh, um, the strength of being British is weakening, the, the strength that underpins that union that Theresa May um, uh, says is, is so uh, precious to her is actually degrading. And what we find is that actually, although we think of British, uh, sorry, of Euroscepticism as a British phenomenon, it's actually an English phenomenon by and large. And that is, so when you start doing the kind of polling where you ask people what nationality they think they are and then link it to their attitudes towards European integration, most people who self-identify as British are pro-EU, and most people who identify as English are anti-EU. All right, so um, uh, I, I'm coming back to this idea of, of um, uh, as, as England as crucial to this. And the last thing I'm going to say uh, before I uh, get to the concluding slides is, is about Westminster as the squeezed middle. And <clears throat> one of the 
you know, the great left behinds of, of, of the Brexit vote um, was actually the Westminster Parliament, you know, because what happened to them was that they had been, if you like, sidelined by uh, the, 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 the popular sovereignty and populism uh, in, implicit uh, in, in the vote and the referendum device. Um, and at the same time, in the wake of that, uh, they had also, or Parliament had also been sidelined by the executive government's desire to take back control uh, um, uh, from various uh, ad administrations and its interpretation of the popular vote as giving it a mandate to get out of the EU without having to seek recourse to Parliament. Now, of course, this was challenged. Um, uh, you know, various uh, MPs, David Lammy from uh, Tottenham, a, a Labour MP, was particularly vocal in this, saying, look, the referendum is only a, a, an advisory thing, you know, his, his belief in the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Referendum is only really advisory. Parliament's got to have a vote now on whether we do really get out or not. Um, now, that might be technically correct, but as I've said before, it's politically inflammatory, uh, and it wasn't able to do it. There was a challenge, of course, um, put into the um, High and Supreme Court, and, and the High Court uh, initially voted that Parliament should have a say on Brexit. So originally, the government wanted to use the royal prerogative. That's the thing that they use to declare war on other, other states. So when we think about what's happening in, or might be happening in Syria soon, that is to do with, um, uh, that is to do with uh, the use of royal prerogative. They were going to use those powers to get out. So the High Court um, decided that that uh, wasn't um, uh, compatible with the, uh, with the British uh, Constitution. Uh, uh, and uh, for their troubles, they were therefore la labelled enemies of the people by, by the Daily Mail. Daily Mail, of course, is not an elected body. Uh, no one voted for the uh, editorial board of the Daily Mail. But this, this is like, a, I'm, I'm using this as an indication of the kind of the, uh, the, the the, the, the populism and, and the, 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 the way Parliament was squeezed between uh, populism uh, and uh, executive uh, authority. Now, of course, they have, or it has, um, uh, got the right to have a so-called meaningful vote uh, on uh, Brexit. It's not clear how meaningful that vote can be uh, once the Brexit deal is known in October. Uh, there won't really be enough time if Parliament rejects it. And we've got to remember, before the vote, Parliament was pro-staying in the EU. Not really clear how much time Parliament will have to, um, uh, or, or how much authority, really, Parliament can bring to bear on, on the negotiations, which are, are like a large you know, ship coming into, into port, needs a long time to, to stop or turn around. But nevertheless, there is a kind of a, a measure of... Um, um, uh, voice uh, has been given to, to Parliament here, but I think it, Parliament has been, or Westminster, I should say, has been one of the great uh, left behinds uh, of the whole Brexit uh, episode. So uh, I'm going to conclude now uh, by saying three things. Right? So um, firstly, just a claim about why it's important to approach it, this, this question of sovereignty uh, and, and Brexit um, uh, from this point of view. The clear differentiation between nations in the vote to leave the European Union created challenges for the asymmetrically devolved nature of the European Union. And so Brexit, therefore, uh, as the, the politics um, both before and after it, opened up contestation uh, with what is still called British politics, um, still actually EU-UK politics. Um, uh, in some ways, we might be better off thinking of this as sort of like Anglo-British, Scottish, uh, Welsh uh, and, and, and Northern Irish politics, precisely because the UK is not a federal polity but a devolved one, where you know notionally Westminster could uh, take back, uh, rescind the powers of the devolved assemblies, um, uh, though that would um, create an, a constitutional crisis of its own. So, if we understand Brexit as not just narrowly the, the referendum uh, on uh, the EU in, in 2016, or Britain's membership of the EU in 2016, but we think of it as an ongoing politics of nationalist mobilisation uh, before and after the, the referendum. It represents a, a moment where key actors sought to take back control, right? not just from the European Union, but from each other too. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ben. We've got uh, about 10 minutes or so for some questions. I think you'll agree with me that it was um, a 
really a very interesting talk and it's and at some points you've thrown a really long historical lens across some of the things we're seeing at the moment so I, I enjoyed it and I'm sure everyone else did. Have we got any bids for questions in the audience? We've got mics on the side if people don't mind. Um, oh no they'll come to you, look at that. <laughs> There's a gentleman up the back and then we'll come to you sir. I think you're good. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, yeah, so when David Cameron won the election, um, he took to the people the policy that he would give them a vote on leaving the EU. And all the polls showed leading into that election that it was going to be very close. A lot of polls showed that Labor was going to win. And then he won this absolutely thumping majority, he didn't need the Liberal Democrats. And he sat there and thought, well, it must be my good charm and my, my, my accent and so on and then took to the people this idea that he would let them leave the EU and was shocked when it happened. It, it just seemed to me there's just a complete misreading of the electorate, including by the Prime Minister, and then he had to fall on his sword. It, was, it just, just seemed to me extraordinary that even he couldn't see the fact that he won the election might have been primarily due to his Brexit policy. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I mean, I think you're ex exactly right to, to highlight how difficult it was to think forward even a couple of years in politics uh, you know at that moment in time and you know of course we've got all sorts of other elections not least here or or in the united states that seem to have a similar pattern and i think um one of the things was there was there was a lot of dealignment taking place or had taken place uh i'll talk about the united kingdom here specifically uh, and the uk independence party was an important part of that and it was really forcing the conservative party to think about, you know, like how are they going to see off this threat? And the referendum um, pledge was an example of, of how to do that. And of course, when he made that pledge in 2013, it seemed like quite a remote possibility. And for the reasons that you've, you've said, you know, winning with that majority uh, and then him wanting to sort of get it out of the road because, you know, early in the, uh, in the term of his uh, next term of his government, uh, all pointed to the fact that it, it seemed to be like uh, it, was, it was going to be another one of those sort of post facto endorsements of, of some settled policy, and it turned out not to be. And I think that it was, you're right, there was all sorts of misreading from politicians, academics, pollsters. Um, there have been parliamentary inquiries into, in, in Britain as to why the polls were so, so uh, inaccurate, and um, there was an awful lot of misreading going on, and, and I think that the, the dis, disalignment um, uh, and, the, and the kind of uh, disillusion with politics was, was, you know, making that weather system hard to read, if you want to use that analogy, but you're, you're absolutely right. There's a gentleman down the front here, Julia, if you... Yeah. Um, my questions, I've got two questions, but they're related to one another. A lot of the coverage we get here in Australia about Brexit is, you know, fairly superficial stuff these days, and it's about the argument about whether it should be a hard exit or a soft exit, etc. My questions are, what is the the general population in all parts of the UK? Are they tuned into this debate, or are they now moved on and leave, leave the others to argue about it? And then that leads into my second question: Where do you think? the UK will be in 10 years' time. Do you think we're creating, you know, earth tremors now that may end up as an earthquake and split, or will it all just move on and people just get back to their ordinary lives? Right, OK. Um, predictions. Um, uh, maybe, uh, first of all, I think um, it's very hard to talk about the United Kingdom electorate or populace in general anymore. Um, if we think about the electorates, I'll keep it at the, at the political rather than the social level. I think it's difficult to talk about that as a, as a unitary body. So, so even last year's general election, which was seen as the most British in, in, the, in his, the fact that um, we saw a return to kind of uh, like 82% of voters voting for the two main parties and the votes distributed you know, throughout, well, basically it means in Scotland. It basically means that the Conservatives won in, uh, some seats in Scotland again. Um, uh, despite that, I think that, that Brexit is understood differently in different parts of the United Kingdom. And uh, now, I'm thinking of the political classes there as much as the, the electorate. So if, if, I, if I sort of think about your question about, you know, are the, is the electorate engaged? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, th I think a lot of people thought um, that when Britain or the United Kingdom voted to leave the EU on the 23rd of June, 
that it would leave on the 24th of June, right? So um, if, I was looking at petitions to Parliament just the other day, and so one of the petitions was like, we need to get out of the EU now, because uh, that, that sentiment was, was not well understood. You know, I mean, that's sort of one of the problems about referendums, isn't it, is that, is that issues aren't very well understood. So um, I think there's some sort of frustration at the negotiation stage and why, you know, like David Davis keeps going to Brussels and it, all this sort of stuff. I mean, in Northern Ireland, the, the debate is quite different and the engagement is quite different to, say, Southern England, right? Um, where, where will the United Kingdom be in 10 years uh, from now? Um, this is being recorded, isn't it? So, uh, uh, you did very well in 2012. Well, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, uh, I'll start off with a safe prediction. It'll still be off the coast of um, France. <laughs> and uh, um, it, then there's this question about, well, well, will it have left and will it be any different? You know, like, so, so the idea is, is that, you know, so one of the Labour Party's pledges is that when Britain gets out, the government has to ensure that um, it, it is, exact, is it in exactly the same position um, uh, or its citizens are in exactly the same position uh, as when it was in. And that's clearly, to me, an unrealistic proposition. You can't leave a, a, a club and have the same rules, right? So, so um, I think that materially it's going to be worse off. I'm, I'm going to bring in the Anglosphere here as a, you know, this, this was sort of one of the off-the-peg winners of, of, of Brexit, actually, was that when no one didn't, had any idea of what to do, um, three of the, the, the cabinet that Theresa May appointed were supporters of so-called Anglosphere, and the idea was is that you know, Britain would trade with places like Australia, and of course Australia would love to trade more with the United Kingdom, and Canada would too. They said so yesterday. But the idea that, that um, uh, you know, getting goods from, Ca from Australia or Canada is going to replace the EU, it, it won't work. You know, even, even a free, free trade deal with the United States, if, depending on how the president's feeling you know, when he wakes up, or, or, or never goes to sleep, because he doesn't seem to go to sleep, does he? But, um, uh, so, uh, look, I, I think it will be um, materially worse off 10 years from now than it is now. Um, uh, it won't be part of the European Union. That sounds like an obvious thing, but that people have been saying, well, it might be. But, um, uh, and um, I, th I think it will find itself more, more isolated than it has been. Mm. Yeah, I, I think Northern Ireland will be, have more to do with the Republic of Ireland and therefore the EU. Uh, I think Scotland will continue on its trajectory, which seems to be the fundamental idea of Scottish nationalism is just like more autonomy, slightly short of independence. Uh, and, and I think Wales will continue to be more or less in step with, with England. The question is England. England has no government of its own. Westminster has direct rule over England. And, and I, think that more, I think one change is that more English people will simply say that's not good enough. But I also, I'm not sure that uh, regional assemblies will, will be the answer. I, th I, think it be, I think the governance of the United Kingdom will be very lopsided. I, I can say that 10 years from now. We've got a chance for one more, Rebecca. Thank you. My question concerns the uh, comments you made towards the end of your speech. Uh, you referred to the royal prerogative to go to war and you referred to the possibility of uh, war against Syria. Um, my recollection is that before Tony Blair joined the invasion of Iraq, he sought parliamentary approval and obtained it. The first time David Cameron wanted to invade Syria, he sought parliamentary approval and he didn't obtain it. He then tried again a year or two later and did obtain it. Many then wrote that a convention had developed in the UK that the UK would not go to war without the approval of the parliament. I gathered from your comment about the royal prerogative to go to war that you do not agree that there is such a convention. It's an issue that's obviously critical to the relationship between the executive and the parliament. And you'll know that there's been much debate in Australia that we shouldn't go to war without parliamentary approval. So I'd be interested in your views whether there is such a convention in the UK. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that is a good point. And, and in August 2013, David Cameron, as you say, didn't get that uh, approval. 
Um, so that means that in, in February 2003, we got an approval. In August 2013, we didn't get an approval. 2015, we did. So it's only two to one in favour. And, and I think that the, the idea of the customary constitution, um, uh, you know, uh, when does it become a convention? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. And, and, I, and I think that we, we have seen instances where um, the executive has overturned what has seen to be enshrined in legislation. And so I'm thinking slightly, a slightly different example, but I think is pertinent, is the Fixed uh, Term Parliaments Act. Right, so one of David Cameron's initial um, uh, ways to kind of try and build in certainty into the, the British uh, political uh, cycle was to say, uh, let's have a fixed uh, term elections of five years. Uh, and of course, when the political opportunity came along for Theresa May to deliver what she thought was going to be a knockout blow to Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, that was simply overturned. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm not convinced yet um, that uh, any sort of convention has bedded down uh, uh, with regard to the royal prerogative uh, and the declaration. Well, of course, it's not, the other thing is it's not a declaration of war, it's just uh, authorising military, you know, military action. So if you want to, so strictly speaking, you know, it, it could be the case, but I, I just don't think it's happened enough yet to be a, to be a convention. Well, thank you very much, Ben. It's been really interesting, and um, I think everyone, you can tell from the questions that um, people have enjoyed it immensely. Well, thank you. Thanks.